So you have learned about the basic principles of the zip nomenclature. You know that you have to assign priorities to each substituent, whereby the priority is dependent on the nuclear mass of each atom bound to. If the substituent with the lowest priority points away from us, we can assign the R and S descriptors. If the substituents are aligned clockwise with regard to descending priority, we assign the R descriptor. If they are aligned counterclockwise, we assign S. If the substituent with the lowest priority points towards us, we have to rethink. Either we imagine what the molecule would look like if we look from it from behind, or we just switch the way we assigned R and S, meaning that the clockwise alignment now means S instead of R and vice versa. However, after teaching some organic chemistry courses, I have noticed that there are some additional rules that one has to know in order to assign priorities for more difficult molecules such as cysteine, which is frequently assigned wrong by students. These rules are not necessarily hidden, but they are often not communicated clearly. So let's have a look at the three rules that I give to my students to gain a better understanding of the zip nomenclature. The last one is a more general principle that might help you for other concepts as well. The first rule regards double bonds. If you have a look at this molecule, priority 1 is obvious because n has a greater mass than carbon. But which of those two carbons has the higher priority? You might have learned that you have to compare the sphere of this carbon to the sphere of this other carbon. I will comment on this in the second rule more deeply, but let's have a try. Many people will compare this oxygen to this oxygen and this hydrogen to this hydrogen. But what do we compare this hydrogen to if the carbon on the right side is only bound to three atoms? The answer lies in the way we should consider double bonds. Double bonds are treated as two single bonds in the zip nomenclature, meaning we can redraw the structure like this. Now it is evident that the right side must have a higher priority than the left side. Same goes for a molecule like this, at which the right side has a higher priority than the left side because we have to redraw the molecule in this manner. For the second rule, let us consider cysteine. Beginners, including me back then, are often confused about the correct priorities of this stereogenic center. Why should the carbon on the left have a higher priority than the carbon on the right? In the end, the carbon on the right is bound to three oxygens, whereby the carbon on the left hand side is bound to only one sulfur and two hydrogens. Well, the answer is that we are not allowed to add up the values of these substituents. Furthermore, I think the underlying problem is a lack of a clear algorithm that allows us to determine the priorities. I like to think of this as some kind of game. Each side sends in the atom with the highest nuclear mass for a duel between both atoms. If one duel is lost, the whole side loses and gets assigned the lower priority. The first duel here takes place between sulfur and oxygen. Sulfur wins and therefore the left side is priority 2, leading to an R configuration. For more complicated examples, there will be a lot of draws. In this example, all three atoms of each side tie with the other side. In the next round, we follow each side along the branch with the highest priority and continue our battles. In this case, the battle ends here, leading to an S configuration. Now the last rule is about the way we draw molecules. Let's say we are supposed to draw a possible product of this reaction and determine its configuration. I often see that the molecule will be drawn like this. If you then try to determine its configuration, you will either struggle or come up with the wrong configuration. The reason for this is that the wedges do not look in the same direction, leading to a confusing molecular structure. This carbon here is not a tetrahedra anymore, this is something else, and therefore this is just the wrong structure. Instead, always draw the wedges into one direction, meaning both up or both down, and draw the other bonds into the opposite direction. Here it does not matter which one of those two wedges looks to the left or to the right side. It only matters that they both look into the same direction. This structure is now unambiguous and allows us an easy and correct determination of the absolute configuration. This rule also helps us determine in Newman or Fisher projections more easily. So definitely consider this for your future organic chemistry tasks. So I hope I could help you and thank you for watching.